Hi, my name is Rahaf Harfouche. I'm an author and a digital foresight strategist living here in Paris. So I'm going to be talking about uh, technology and how it's impacting our digital identities and how our behaviors online are helping to forge and impact our offline identities and the way we live our lives. Thank you. Um, I'm Rahaf, and uh, today I'm going to talk about your relationship with technology. Today we're living in a world where the rate of innovation is moving so fast that institutions and governments and businesses just can't keep up. And what we're starting to see is this emerging gap between the systems that our society needs and the systems that we currently have. And what is really cool about what's happening with technology today is that for the first time, thanks to the availability of all of these platforms, we are seeing individuals who are now empowered to actually step up and try to tackle some of these issues. And they're having a remarkable impact. They're having an impact at a global scale. We're living in an era today that is really highlighting just how much reach and power and potential that each of us here today, each individual can have on society. So think of individuals like Julian Assange, the founder of WikiLeaks, and how in publishing private and confidential government documents online and making them available to the public, on how he was able to actually impact on a global level the diplomatic relationships between, between two countries. Think of President Barack Obama, who in 2008 was able to use technology to completely rewrite the rules of political fundraising. So using tools that existed, you know, like Twitter and email and text messaging campaigns and even iPhone apps, the Obama campaign raised $750 million. Now from that $750 million, 500 million were donated via online platforms. He literally changed the way that every single political campaign would be run from that moment forward. We're seeing uh, in the Middle East right now tons of individuals, activists, that are using everything from Google Docs to Facebook groups to mobilize and rally and take on governments who are no longer, as Bob mentions, supporting the needs of their people. In Syria right now, where every single day, you know, tens and tens of people are, are, are dying, over 9,000 people have, have died in the conflict so far, they're using a platform called Ushahidi. And Ushahidi is a, a crowdsource map. Ushahidi is a Swahili word that means testimony. And what this allows people to do is that it allows any individual to take their cell phone and to report any incident that they see, anything from skirmishes with local authorities to um, deaths, to people being illegally detained, to protests, and these individuals, at great risk to themselves, are giving us, the rest of the world, an opportunity to get on the ground perspective from conflict zones where traditional media are having a very difficult time trying to understand and get accurate information. So what this means is that we're living in a world today where thanks to technology, we're all becoming what I call architects. And an architect is somebody who either creates new technology or who uses existing technology in a new way to rebuild the world around them and to disrupt the status quo. But what I want to focus on today is something a lot more intimate. And I've shown you examples of how technology is being applied externally to disrupt industries and governments. But what we're also realizing as well is that we're using technology to, to do something that's impacting us on a much more fundamental level. Today, we're using technology to build and define our own identities, our digital selves. So, our digital self, or digital identity, which was also known as online presence, is evolving from a reflection of who we are to an extension of who we are. 
And what that means is that thanks to technology, we're able to express ourselves in different ways and we're able to interact with each other in ways that just weren't available uh, you know, 10 years ago, even five years ago. And the result is that we are now able to, to be online in a different way. The lines between who we are online and who we are offline are becoming blurred. And the result is an aspect of our own identities that I don't think we even fully comprehend the implications of what it means to live this way. So this is a philosopher named David Hume. He's an 18th century Scottish philosopher. And he says that he doesn't really believe that there's um, a real concept, one solid concept of an identity, of something or someone. He was a bundle theorist, and that means that he believed that each thing or person was actually made up of several smaller things called impressions, which were either sensory stimuli or emotional triggers, and that a collection of these would come together and form our concept of whatever it was that we were looking at. So take this apple above me, for example. Uh, for me, when I think of an apple, I think of the feel of it in my hand, the crunch it makes when I take a bite, the sweet taste of it. For me, the smell always reminds me of fall and going back to school. And after this presentation, I know I'll always associate apples with TEDx ESCP. So now if you extend that out to people, it's the much of the same uh, philosophy. So think of your grandmother, your best friend, your boss, and all the different pieces that make up who they are. Now what technology has enabled us to do is that we can actually upload those pieces of who we are online. The little impressions that make up the nuts and bolts, the very foundation of our identity now live in the cloud. And who are we or what are we if not the sum of our collective experiences? So this is a snapshot from a service called Mirror.me. And what this site does is it takes the entire, um, all of the tweets that I've put, I've been on Twitter for four years as of last week, and this, it generates a picture based on all of the things that I've tweeted about during this time. So this is a digital snapshot, one small aspect of who I am. Now, this is just one social network. Now, imagine if on top of that, I also layered on top of that all of the places I've checked it in Foursquare, all the books I've read on Goodreads, all the movies I've watched on Netflix, all the photos of my vacations I've put on Flickr, all the friends that I've, that I've made using Facebook. All of these things, what if there was a way to represent that? And that is my, the digital me. And what we're starting to see is this digital me, our digital identity, is something that's far more complex than simply a tag cloud that represents who we are. And it's raising some interesting questions that I think are going to become increasingly important issues for us to figure out as we live more and more of our lives online. The first issue is ownership. So who owns all these pieces of you? For me, Gmail, or Google, owns the last eight years of all the chats and conversations that we've had online with my family and friends. Facebook owns all of the check-ins and the photos and the connections that I've made with people over the last few years. All of this information, pieces of who I am, live on their servers. And it lives on their servers because the digital us, which is really a bundle of data, is valuable to them. We are a product. It's what they use to make money. So our digital identity has been transformed into a digital asset. And digital assets need to be protected because much like offline assets, the more you put into it, the more you invest, the more data you put in, the more value it's going to generate in the long term. And we need to be aware of how we can properly manage it. So I'll give you an example. Death. We're all going to one day die. And Facebook, if you aren't going to die, you should probably let me know your secret. But um, Facebook estimates that by 2015, there will be 50 million people who will die and leave their Facebook accounts behind. So what should happen? Who is going to own the potentially decades worth of data that you've collected over your lifetime? It's given rise to entrepreneurs who have created services like Legacy Locker, where you can actually manage your digital estate and you can specify which pieces of your online self you would like to, to pass on to family or friends and what you would like to do with it.
So for example, I can leave the URL of my blog to my sister. I could give my login credentials to my, e uh, to the, to my emails to my mother and request that my Gmail be deleted. And this is going to become an increasingly important issue as we continue to collect decades and decades and decades of data. Now, what's imp important to note is that the, the second issue is really about the lack of decay or the fact that the internet has a perfect memory. And what this means is that unlike our offline selves, where we show different pieces of ourselves to different people, think of yourself as a colleague or a friend or a spouse, those people get to see different parts of you. Online, it's actually getting much harder to have those separations. Just because I have my professional life in LinkedIn doesn't mean that if someone Googles my name, they're not going to see you know, a joke I left on a website or a tweet or, or a picture that I've posted. So we need to be aware that these boundaries are blurring, not just between the different parts of us, but we also have to add in time. Now, what's happening is as we're living more of our lives online, something that you said online when you're 20 could theoretically still exist online when you're 40. And as we continue to live our lives, think of the things that you say and how much you want the things that you said at 25 to be linked at, you know, to you still when you're 65. The other thing to consider in terms of what's being collected is it's not just the information that you're actively sharing. It's not just the pictures of you on vacation where you look great or the witty status updates. It's also the fact that there are other pieces that are being used to calculate or to define your digital identity. And that includes things that we would consider private, which are things like our browsing history, our search queries. These things are also impacting who we are. And they're also playing a part in our digital identity. And that means that you're off, you're on Online life is having very real consequences on your offline life. So uh, this is a map of, uh, to show a practice called redlining. And redlining is a practice used by banks to outline areas of cities where they would or would not provide loans. So if you lived in a poor area, you would generally have a much harder time to get a loan than if you lived in a more affluent neighborhood. And what we're starting to see now is something similar appearing online called weblining. So weblining is the practice of denying somebody an opportunity based on their digital selves. So for example, it's just the beginning, but it's starting to happen. You could be denied access to certain uh, health care insurance based on a search query you typed into Google. Now, the internet isn't very good with context, so ultimately, it doesn't know if you've done this for a friend, and it doesn't know if you've done this as a joke. It just knows that Rahaf searched for diabetes. So to wrap up, I just want to remind you that this isn't a good thing or a bad thing. This is just the way it is now. The pieces of our identity are going to include much larger things, not just the things we actively share, but the things that we might not even be aware of that we're sharing. And every time you do something online, you're leaving traces of your digital identity behind. So as architects, we have the ability to change the world. And let's use that same creativity and that same ingenuity and protect and nurture the most important resource we have, which is our digital selves. Thank you.